So let's just start with with Alan. Welcome back. Thanks, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. So the strike call that is on the screen has three uh, changes in it. So the first uh, is right on line eight. And originally, the new section, I was going to call it um, Native American place names in state parks, but I think it's more proper to refer to Abenaki because that is the language. So Abenaki place names in state parks. So just Definitely. a small tweak there. Um, and then the other piece of new language here in section one is adding uh, a subdivision C, which starts on line 17. And so this says, the commissioner shall adopt rules establishing a procedure for selecting spelling of the place name if there are multiple spellings provided by the commission on Native American affairs. So I had it go to a rulemaking process. Um, Okay. Uh, and then in section two, I added one sentence. So this is the session law provision that is having the Commission on Native American Affairs prepare the list of place names for the commissioner. So I added, uh, starting on line four, the list shall state if there are multiple names or spelling variations for a place. Um, so that was just to highlight if they are aware that there is potential conflict between local spellings, they should put that on the list also. And this came, again, the conversation on this came up because I think the commissioner expressed a, that there could be a potential frustration of having gone through this process and then coming up with what might be determined to be the wrong spelling. Right, and so uh, I thought it made sense to have the commission be the, the group that added it to the list rather than, um, you know, if the commissioner was to sort of check individually if anyone else had any other spellings, let's just have it all be on the list prepared by the commission. So. Okay. Well, my sense was that uh, because of the different, um, the, the four different bands, and we heard some would like it, if it's regionally specific, could they have that version? And the commissioner said, oh, well, I, I, of course, I don't really care. I just need to know what to do. So I think in the first part, should they really be the, should, should the commissioner determine or should the Commission on Native Americans affairs determine what is the appropriate name for that spot. I think the commissioner, right, what you're doing here is- I believe the language, John, if I read the language correctly, this is just saying that the commissioner, so on line 17, that the commissioner adopts rules establishing a procedure for selecting the spelling. I think that's gonna be the equivalent of, you know, of him saying, well, if the Native American Commission, the Commission on Native American Affairs, says that the, that it's spelled W-H-I-T-E, and the local, the Missisquoi band spells it W-H-Y-T-E. You know, I think he's got this, the rule will be that, along with the list of the names, that, that the commissioner will just make sure he checks with the local bands. I think that's what was expressed. Right. But uh, I understand that, but shouldn't the Commission on Native American Affairs be the re relationship to the different bands? And just so the commissioner can say, in, they can say in this region, this is what it would be called. Like who, yeah. who's expert? I think the commissioner wanted to make sure he wasn't the expert. And that, that's my concern. I, I would well, the commission also expressed and has expressed consistently this year especially that even though there's a commission on Native American affairs that they don't speak for everybody. And I think that's where this conflict came up was that the commission may, you know, come up with the name spellings and and I guess the commissioner didn't want to didn't want to have to be the arbiter. No, I, I think... Am I remembering that right? I mean, I... Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. But I think in here, he's the arbiter. I mean, that's in your work. Well, uh, I, think, I think the language is pretty clear. It says a commissioner, commissioner shall adopt rules establishing a procedure. It doesn't say he's yeah. going to select the word. That's exactly right. But he's going to establish yeah, I, I, I the guidelines to do it. And so the procedure may be we go with the local bands. Yeah. Okay. I, I got it. I'm good yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I think it's actually creating a lot of ability to flexibility with this situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was thinking through the various ways that it could happen, and I think having the commissioner have that flexibility to establish the, the procedure makes sense. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Dan Dickerson from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, should have a fiscal one on here. Yeah, maybe it reach. Um, it, it is there. So I, I reached out to uh, Commissioner Snyder about the cost of, you know, replacing signs under normal circumstances, and you know what his thoughts were on, you know, if, if you're going to replace a sign anyways, what's the incremental cost of adding that wording? And on the second point, he didn't have any idea, but on the on the first point. Um, you know, he, he gave me a broad number um, for raising. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, hold on. Oh, sure. Yeah, one second. Can you hit the, the, hit the reset, uh, the re whatever button? Refresh. Refresh button. Up top for the pull rounds. There he is. Oh, okay. There you go. You're all yeah, right. Thank you. There. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. Um, so as I said, uh, I reached out to Commissioner Snyder um, with his thoughts on, on what the costs were. So uh, most of this fiscal note reflects you know, what came to me from Forest Parks and Rec, um, although I made a few of my own assumptions, and I'll point those out. Um, but ultimately, what was given to me is that um, if, if the department would replace all the entrance signs, it would be 150000 um, And to replace all signs in state parks, it was 235000 um, Commissioner Snyder was aware of 15 parks that are currently known to have corresponding Abenaki place names. Replacing those signs would be 50,000. And I guess to backtrack briefly, uh, when he got back to me, he was thinking that um, this bill would only impact entrance signs. Um, and my fiscal note, um, although I acknowledge what he said, I, I base it off of, you know, this applies to all signs, because I, I didn't see any wording in the bill that said, well, it's only entrance signs, or it's only these signs, or it's only these signs. I, I saw mm -hmm. it to encompass the whole universe of signage in state parks. Um, but when he got back to me, he said, replacing entrance signs for those 15 places would be 50,000. Um, but given that the bill gives until 2025, um, you know, it's unclear when those costs would be incurred. Um, so the way I the way I constructed the fiscal note was, um, I thought, well, because the bill applies to all signage, one hundred fifty thousand as a total cost, which represents, um, let's see here, sixty four percent of the two thirty five cost seems pretty reasonable to me as as what would need to be replaced ultimately over the next five years. Um, and so in, in giving my estimate, I assumed that FY21, because the department probably already has a signage replacement plan, that any incremental cost is going to be pretty low. It will be, you know, an extra square footage of wood to add, add the name. And then in 22 to 25, um, it would be, you know, some portion of 150000 And I applied it evenly, 35 to 40000 per year. Um, what I did note is that um, because there's no revenue in the bill, this is an unfunded mandate. And whether or not the department can absorb that or raise revenue through state parks fees is unclear to me, given that you know really the cost wouldn't start to be incurred until 22, and you know the economic complaint, especially given today, the, the economic climate could change dramatically, which would mean you know if you want a general fund dollars, those aren't going to be available. But you know if people stop traveling out of state and go to state parks, then there could be more state park money to fund improvements. But you know, I, I just pointed out that because there's no revenue, um, the commissioner would have to seek funding right. for and I think the that, project. Yeah, and I think that the initial cost being less than five thousand dollars and my memory of the testimony was that um, you know that the place names could be the entrances, but it could also be like if there was a uh, uh, small woods Overlook, you know that that had a name, you know that that would be. But that's also that these would be um, 
if there was a Moss Glen Falls, if there was a name, if there was an Abenaki translation of Moss Glen Falls, that Moss Glen Falls would still be there. So that replacement cost, which he's already, it's part of his program, that would, the English version of that would exist, but this would be additional. You know that this that these Abenaki names would be in addition to the English language names. Um, that was my which kind of lines up to what you're what you're talking about. Um, so I think that that's no. I think this is great. This is this is exactly what we just need to have for an idea um, for our homework, and um, we'll pass this along, especially because the cost for this here. I, again, we all know that. Even without what's going on, the fiscal picture is yeah, it's in it's flux. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I will say that, I mean, because a lot of this is somewhat speculative. I mean, it could be it could be less than this. I mean, you know, he told me that signs are replaced every ten years, and given that this is a five year timeline, a lot of these signs, you know, might be in the replacement budget anyways. Um, but, you know, given that it's a five year timeline, it could also you know, force him to alter some of those replacement timelines. Um, so it could be less. Um, I, I doubt it will be more. Right. But no, and, and I think that's right. I think your sentence that says it's, it's unlikely that all state parks have corresponding names also plays into that yeah. as well. Mary? Um, this is just a comment. After the testimony we heard, um, I was speaking with Representative Gina, and we said, what if the chief who was here, who does woodworking, what if he made the signs? For example, what if they had um, kids get together and make the signs? I mean, the state would have to pay for the supplies, but would it be less expensive? Perhaps. I, I imagine the department probably has design standards, so I, mm. or if, that's my guess. I don't know for sure, um, but but certainly, I mean, it's, it's an idea that could definitely save the state some money, you know, from, from what I've given in this estimate, but I, you know, I don't know how much. I don't know how much time that um, kids or the chief would have to spend on that sort of thing. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's just something that would be contracted with them, whether it's for money or for other things. Yeah. That would be a project that would be, I think that would be contracted. And we'd have to, because I remember you know, whether they were doing this, just the symbols for certain. I remember Mike talking about symbols for you know, no swimming. We have pretty international based symbols that have, you know, just across it, whether or not there's an Indian picture of fishing like that. You know, I get it. Um, all right. Any questions for I mean, I think this is, I think we're pretty, yeah. I think, I mean, having this as, again, as our, as what we'll attach, this will go because there's an expenditure, it will more than likely go next door. Um, but next door knows that these are priorities for us to go coincide with mm -hmm. the apology um, and the task force that we're putting together. So hopefully they'll be received. Um, yeah, I think this one's about as cut and dry as anything we've seen on this topic. Yeah. 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 Great. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Alan. Um, did you, um, we would probably vote on this tomorrow morning at some point. So as long as we have a clean version of it, if you can provide Ron with a clean version of it um, with the appropriate signature line, um, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Damien is here and, and Representative Kovalhansis is here to talk about the uh, committee bill for the task force. But before we get going, I just want to fill people in who missed the conversation on H880, which is the place names. Uh, they have an active place names bill. We're going to um, have Ellen come back for a minute at, towards the end of the day. It turns out, so she added language that was um, requested by the commissioner. 
about just having a different kind of, uh, having a, a way to arbitrate the potential for uh, potentially differently spelled Abenaki names. And then Dan Dickerson did a joint, uh, did a fiscal note where, uh, and then I got a note back from the speaker who said there would be zero impact on the budget if we took away the time frame, because the bill says over the next five years. Um, to replace or to create these signs. But if we didn't put a deadline on it, if we just let it be open-ended and be part of the sign-making process, then there wouldn't be any immediate impact on the budget um, and be handled differently. So that's just something we'll consider very quickly when, when um, the attorney comes back, when Alan comes back. Um, but first, or next, um, Representative Copeland Hansis is here because there is a bill in their committee that she's going to talk about that as we create this task force for the to create the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, it kind of dovetails with this bill with H-478 that's in her committee. So I just asked her to talk about what the story is with that bill and what the process or what the um, status is and what um, how they may be able to piggyback onto our bill. Okay. For the record, Representative Sarah Copeland hands us from the Government Operations Committee. And um, first of all, do, do you have someone who's on the phone with you as well? Yes, it's yes. John Kalaki. Oh, hi, John. Hello. Um, that's wonderful that you're uh, making access available to people who can't be here in person. So thank you for doing that. Um, this is a really important topic, and I really want to, first of all, say thank you for digging into the difficult conversations around, um, uh, around populations who have been subject to sort of uh, systemic discrimination for various reasons. Um, and when I heard that in addition to your resolution, you were also creating um, a task force to look at a truth and reconciliation process. Um, I wanted to be able to uh, to make a request to you that this task force also consider, um, in addition to the issues around eugenics and institutionalization and sterilization that we know um, uh, that you have been spending a lot of time talking about with respect to the apology resolution, I would like to also suggest that uh, that this task force might also look at um, the, uh, the lifetime impacts of uh, institutional racism that have, uh, have persisted because of slavery. Um, we've had a lot of pressure uh, coming to our committee to pass, uh, a, as your chair said, H-478. Um, and we have been focused on um, and many other issues that didn't really leave us time to do justice to uh, considering 478. But if I had had an opportunity to consider this concept of a task force that would set about a truth and reconciliation process, that's what I would have mimicked. And so um, I just want to ask you if you would consider um, including uh, uh, the, the mandate to this task force, in, including having them consider um, uh, systemic uh, uh, bias resulting from, uh, from slavery. And I'm happy to take any questions or um, to the extent that you're... And uh, Damien? has raised his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I realize I'm not at the table, um, but just to clarify, um, are you asking that the committee consider having the task force look at setting up uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission so it can also look at the lifetime impacts of uh, systemic and institutionalized racism and slavery? or maybe look at setting up a, have the task force look at possibly setting up a separate Truth and Reconciliation Commission, just want to so get some more clarity. I would, I would suggest that that be left as open as you feel comfortable, um, whether the task force recommends two separate Truth and Reconciliation processes that are 
that are completely separate from each other or whether the task force um, can find a way to, to consider them side by side. Um, it, it's really difficult to know because the, um, the populations are very different. The, the experiences of the people who, um, who have uh, been, who have experienced these, um, these injustices uh, is very different. I don't know if they would be, I don't know if the process would feel comfortable for them to be a part of the same truth and reconciliation process or if the task force might recommend um, establishing separate. Um, and so I would suggest leaving it to the task force to decide. And then as you appoint members to the task force, I, I would just also make note that we have a, a social equity caucus within the House and the Senate together and that that members of the task force could be um, could be nominated more broadly from that social equity task force um, our social equity caucus could could nominate some folks who might potentially be serving on the task force at the appointment of the speaker or the pro tem or, or whoever Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. So that would be that, that would, and as we create a charge for the task force, it would be to consider what forms it may take. Mm -hmm. um, would you, so in H478, can you just go back and just tell us what H478 um, was? to do, I mean, I, I, we don't have it up on our, on our web page, but um, mm -hmm. if you could just give us a quick primer on what H-478 requested. I will. Um, I'm going to take it right from the bill, if I can find it. You might be able so, to just in, the, in the bill number, you might just be able to, mm -hmm. in the search okay. bar. So an act relating to establishing a task force to study and consider a state apology and a proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery. And so um, to establish a task force to study and consider an apology, um, I think that uh, I don't know. I, I think the, the direction that you're heading is a more elegant way of accomplishing um, the same process and the importance of, uh, of bringing together a group of people to, to figure out how a Truth and Reconciliation <coughs> Commission um, might act on issues resulting from the institution of slavery um, is a more... Uh, I think a more productive conversation than than simply to study and and consider an apology for slavery and reparations. Um, it could very well include the same people, but um, but I like the and and this bill was not um, not terribly. It, we haven't worked a lot on figuring out um, who might have sat on this task force that was considered in 478. But I think that in looking at the, the words that you have on the page on your committee bill, I think it's very easy to see how you might, how you might also uh, appoint people to your task force that could, um, and could work on establishing that Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is John. I, I think it's interesting to, and as long as we're not trying to bash them all together, it looks like the multi culti solution to everything of, you know, that I think if we leave it open-ended and that this task force is charged, this Truth and Reconciliation Task Force is charged to look at some of the systemic oppression in its history, including, and we, we list the things that um, both in the resolution and, sir, what you're talking about. Um, and from that task force, they can say that, you know, these cannot be combined, these are too complex, we need different, um, 
you know, record, reconciliation processes, we need different preparation processes and things. And so that, um, I think it's the way to do it. I, I want to make sure we're not sliding any one issue in, in kind of merging them all together and that we don't want to seem like it's, um, you know, a, uh, I, I think I said it already. I don't want to miss the board of any of it. Uh, well, I think we could uh, we could design this so it would be up to the task force to figure out how to accomplish that. Because they may want to have separate processes, for example, for the slavery as opposed to the Abenaki situation because they are, mm -hmm. there are similarities, but there clearly are huge differences as well. Uh, and maybe we don't need to get too much into the weeds on how to do that. But the task force figures yeah, that's out. The task force is where is that, I mean, they're <clears throat> discussing all the totally different types, uh, you know, situations. If we the subject give, matter is still kind of the yeah. If we give them the task, the task, and they're we want you to approaches for each. Figure it's out like how yeah. how to respond to each of these populations exactly. that we have identified. Yeah. It's a, it just strikes me difficult to uh, how do, how would you how do you introduce four million Africans into this into this uh, or not? Right. Yeah, I mean that that's what this. These are the findings, right? Right. These are, I mean, these are the, these are the findings that would be the just the legislative justification for. Um, but but I think we're not. I think what we're trying to do here is include people who who feel like this conversation is necessary. Into it, so it's not it's not just saying it's not stipulating that we're working on four million people. No, it's, just, it's just staggering to look at it. It's just it's too tragic. Yeah. But if you keep scrolling, Mary, I mean it's you'll see that it, it I think the, the question that, that that Representative Pence is getting help Copeland is getting to is 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 keep going, is keep going, you know, is is um, really starts here. And while it says, you know, that under these duties, this is specific to what they're asking, but in the case of um, in the case of what, if we were to plug them into ours, it wouldn't be this. It wouldn't be this specific. It would be about. No, I think it. I I would prefer that it be left to the task force to yeah. your task force to decide what the what the directive and the focus is of a truth and reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't I don't know that I, I certainly didn't feel that my committee had the the personnel and the time and the wherewithal to do justice to um, to this but I think a task force who who is made up of members of these communities um, could do a much more uh, effective job at designing what that process looks like. Lisa. I'm just going to um, make a, a very brief comment that I feel that this is too much for one task force to add all of that. And I know it, we're not supposed to be getting into the weeds, but um, I would prefer to see two separate task force, one for eugenics and one for slavery. And I'm not normally in favor of all kinds of task force and study groups, but I think these are two very different issues. So could we in this bill call for that? Because I think you have a great merit in what you're talking about, because even with just the eugenics one, a number of the people from the different Abenaki tribes really wanted to make sure that all the tribes are represented. So it may be that we now say that we're asking for uh, Truth and Rel uh, Reconciliation Task Forces be assembled to. Um, and we, we list the two different ones. And I think along with that, John, you may have missed my comments <clears throat> later in the day yesterday 
about including the voice of French Canadians and right. other mixed race folks in the discussion. And I think we're now talking about a task force that's getting pretty unwieldy in terms of the number of people who need to be represented on that task force. And from my personal experience working on boards and committees, the bigger, the bigger it gets, the harder it gets. To so I'm saying two different tasks. Right. So I'm I'm adding on to that 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 that's even more reinforcing what I was talking about yesterday. Thank you. So um, I'll ask the question again: Are committee bills subject to crossover? Yes. They are. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to decide <clears throat> on this change in the next. It needs to get voted out by the end of the day, Friday. Unless we get, unless it, we ask for more time. Right. Good. And this is an important piece of the whole process. And so um, when we, if we ask for more time, then you know, we'll see what the answer is. So that is a a thing that we're able to do is ask for more time on a committee bill past the crossover date. We can ask for it. And not guaranteed, obviously, that we would get it. This is a priority of the caucus, of not just the caucus, but this has been a priority of the House through our committee. Um, had over 50 sponsors. And um, the, the apology did. Mm -hmm. And as we as we talked about with this earlier, you know, this is this is the first step in. We've, we've worked on an apology. We're listening. This is the first step in the doing of something. And so, um, so I would think that if we ask for time, that we may receive it. You know, it would be likely that we would receive it. But it would probably only be like a week or something. Dispensation time. wouldn't last longer than a week. Mm -hmm. Right. But what I call dispensation. I think we're really digressing in so many different directions now as of the Friday before we left on break that this is becoming a whole different thing than the original res resolution that 50 plus of us signed on to. This, I feel like it's, it, it's really quite big. Um, and I don't think an extra week is going to help me make up my mind about all of the new material that we've been presented with. Well, I can't. I mean, that's, no. what, that's what we'll have. I know. So I get that. Um, I just think adding to it, adding more to it, is making it even more difficult. Well, let's see what um, you know, Damien's been able to um, have been reached out to and um, able to present a, a, another version of what we, we haven't seen this for a little while, the, um, mm -hmm. the task force bill. And so they'll share with us what some of the changes were put in were requested prior to the break. And then the request on this is, was has been worked on. Um, this request came through through um, government operations to be considered. So Damien's, Damien has some language to share. Take a look at it. So Tommy, I, as you describe it, I, I just feel like what you're describing is like a meta task force, right? It's a task force to iterate other tasks, task forces. I don't want, I mean, as we have it crafted now, we have a task force suited to a specific task, and now we're going to glom on an additional task that would require a completely, in my view, a completely different task force. So if we're going to do this, I feel like we have to rewrite the whole thing and say now we're going to have a task force to, to iterate two different task force for two different tasks. This kind of like, we're going to kind of come up with one meta task force that's somehow going to accomplish all these things. Just well, we could do it that way, or let the task force decide how they're going to manage that. But this task force, in this original language, was 
constructed with a specific task in mind, and now we're just saying, oh, but we'll just throw this other task at you. That doesn't seem to make any. Well, there are, are there are some common entities who would likely be mm -hmm. part of mm -hmm. helping both uh, both groups uh, form a uh, um, truth and reconciliation process. Um, and uh, I would leave it as open-ended as need be to allow for common convening entity like the Human Rights Commission to decide how much of that process happens together as a group versus how much of it gets assigned to subcommittees who can work through their own processes and their own details. But because the Human Rights Commission, I think, um, has uh, has good ties in both communities that they would be the convening entity who could help make uh, make sure that those two processes happen in their own genuine way. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Gonzalez, thank you much. And just also thinking about in terms of, of the you use the word process and when we are talking about. Um, when we've been talking about the task force, talking about what the process is for thinking, um, thinking through what has happened and what would be a good next step. And so those similar processes could be the same even though the population is different. And thinking about that, um, those uh, best practices that we can see from other places that have done similar things, that, that having one umbrella uh, Group to to talk about what the pro, what the appropriate governmental process is would save time and energy, and that overlap in actual personnel would uh, maximize the expertise, um, and then being able to, to separate out into those different subgroups for the, the particularities. And, and what I like the, um, about what we've been talking about for our task force, as opposed to the very prescriptive bill that that government operations had on the bill is on the wall is is that it, um, it, it allows for the, the um, findings, for folks to follow the findings, rather than um, having it be very prescriptive in this. So I, for one, <clears throat> am very opposed to changing what we have done so far. Historically, in this country, Indigenous people have been given the short shrift by government and by encompassing and enlarging even separate but equal, it's going to change that entirely. And I am not in agreement with it. Well, let's go see what the language is, actually, instead of imagining the worst that it could possibly be. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you good luck with your deliberations, and thank you again for working on this. It's very thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon.